Hello, everyone. Welcome to the channel. I'm Dr. Sylvia, a general practitioner and health educator. I'm so pleased if you're joining me live today. Welcome. Thank you for popping in and um, tell me where you're watching from. Tell me where you are, what's going on around you. I hope you're doing well. Today's live stream follows on um, in our mini series. We're doing a mini series on endometriosis. We've got one video already down and um, a playlist is what we're creating. And we're going to be looking a lot more about this subject. I know we don't talk about it a lot, um, but it's a really important medical condition that affects women. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. But thank you for joining me. Don't forget, Ask Away Health is the health channel where we explore and break down health issues in a way that you can understand them and just help you live better lives, make better decisions. So um, we address these health issues on my videos. I publish lots of videos, usually at least once or twice a week if you check the channel. But you can also visit the Ask Away Health community forum and you can send a question using our email information service. Both the links to these services, to these um, parts of our platform will be in the links in the description box for this video. Join the community forum to share your experience, to participate in discussions, to ask questions and get help about health issues. Or if you want to get a specialized, customized response from me, please use the email health information service. So we're talking about endometriosis. Last time we looked at 10 questions that sort of centered around the background to endometriosis. We're going to dive a little bit deeper. We might cover some of the same issues that we talked about the last time. But if you missed our last stream, please go and have a look at it. I've also placed the link for that in the description box because I think it's useful um, if you're just hearing about this subject for the first time or if you heard about it and come to YouTube to search and you've come across this video, I do have a lot of um, other videos that are dedicated to just explaining what the condition is. In this one, we're going to look at some of the frequently asked questions around endometriosis, around living with endometriosis, its diagnosis and so on. So let us begin with the first one. I'm just going to pull up the questions so that we're going along together with the questions. Um, and if you're joining again live, please say hi. Let me know where you're coming from. So the first question is why endometriosis happens. And if you're somebody who um, doesn't know what endometriosis is, briefly, I'll describe it as a condition that affects women of childbearing age. So that's where we find it. And that's where it causes the most problems. And what happens is that tissue that behaves like womb tissue some scientists believe that it's actually womb tissue, but there's a bit of a disagreement. However, whether you think it's tissue that is actually coming from the womb or tissue that is behaving like the womb, this tissue finds itself in other parts of the body apart from the womb. What is important about this tissue is that it behaves in the same way as the womb. So it responds. It is under the influence of hormones. It responds to hormones, estrogen and progesterone in particular. So if you think of what happens to a woman in her reproductive age, as a woman goes through a monthly menstrual cycle, this is where the problem with endometriosis happens because at the end of each month or at the end of each cycle, a woman begins to shed blood and other material through her vagina from the womb. And this is the same thing that happens to all these other pieces of tissue that are located in other parts outside the womb, commonly um, the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, but even way outside the abdomen going towards the chest. Some women have been, have been found to have endometriosis. We've been very far out extreme areas, but commonly around the womb, sorry, <laughs> womb, around the ovaries, the fallopian tube, um, the tissues that hold these structures in place. So things like the um, what we call it, the peritone, is the cavity where you have these organs. So the tissues that surround them, and um, you can also find endometriosis. So you get abnormal bleeding as a result, irritation, because this bleeding is happening where it shouldn't. And because the bleeding is present, it makes different pieces of tissue sticky. They start forming patches, they form scars, causes a lot of problem um, for somebody who has endometriosis. So that's the simple definition. Um, tissue that shouldn't belong in a particular area finds itself there. This tissue behaves like the womb and it creates problems where a woman starts having um, abnormal, painful periods, um, um, back pain, pelvic pain and so on. In fact, I've got a nice video that demonstrates this very well. So let me just pull it up for you. 
And I think we're going to have a closer look at the video at some point in the stream. Okay, so this is the video. Um, uh, this is the clip that tells us about um, the symptoms of endometriosis. I'll just pull away the question. Yeah, so pelvic pain, painful periods, um, deep painful sex, painful defecation or stooling with your period. So somebody who is going to the toilet during her period and it's very painful, having trouble passing urine, it's very painful when you pass urine, back pain, struggling because of the abnormal amount of blood that's being lost, um, causing um, tiredness from anemia, trouble with fertility, up to 30% of women or even a bit more can have tr trouble getting pregnant because of endometriosis and of course because of the abnormality in this structure the way the, the womb responds to these hormones you can have very heavy periods irregular periods bloating nausea and vomiting so these are some of the symptoms that you can have with endometriosis okay so um before we carry on let me just take this off before we carry on hello from hi um I've got Emily from Pretoria. I have fibroids and they booked me for operation. Can you help? Oh gosh. Hi, Emily. Thank you so much for joining the screen. Uh, we're talking about endometriosis today and um, fibroids, a completely different problem. I am happy to help. I would need to, of course, find out more information. Exactly what is it that you need to know? I think the best thing, like I said at the beginning, is to send an inquiry and um, go to the link um, in this video, the description box, I've put a link for the health information service that allows you to send as much information as you can in that area. And I can have a look at it and get back to you. So please use it. And then we can, you know, look at how best to help you with this problem. Um, and I hope just wish you all the best with um, things going forward with the operation. So we're looking at why endometriosis happens. And um, we've talked about what endometriosis is. I've explained for somebody who doesn't know, this is what endometriosis is. Why it happens, we don't know. OK, it's one of these things that we don't know the cause of endometriosis or why it develops. We haven't got that information to us yet. There are a few theories and um, theories mean that, you know, we put together some ideas or suggestions about what could be responsible and then we test these things. And so there are quite a few theories out there. But the thing about them is not all of them, not, none of them completely answers the question and that's why they're theories that's why we don't have a cause yet you might find that it's one of the theories suggests the cause in a particular group of women but it doesn't in another group of women so you can't say that it is the cause but examples examples of these theories we'll talk about them we do also have we call them risk factors. So a woman may have a particular situation, condition or scenario that might make it more likely or less likely for her to develop endometriosis. So let's talk about some of the ones that we're aware of. There are quite a few, but I'm just going to go through some of them. So these are some of the issues that may happen that a woman may then um, may be more likely to develop an endometriosis. For example, if she was a low birth weight baby and by that I mean if you weighed less than two and a half kilograms 2.5 kilograms or about five less than six pounds between five and six pounds when you were born you may be more likely to develop endometriosis um another um, risk factor is women who start their periods early menarche is that word we used to describe starting your periods when you first start your periods, when you first start having your monthly flow as a girl. Um, so menarche is the beginning of your menstrual cycle, your menstrual uh, reproductive um, life, if you if you like, you can refer to it that way. And it, it varies. Some girls will see there's about 10. I think I was about 10 or 11 when I saw mine. And um, some girls might see there's about 12, some a little bit earlier. So it tends to vary. So there's a, a, a range. But when it comes particularly early, um, and so you're seeing your first period around the age of eight or nine that is considered to be a little bit earlier than what is the average so when it happens early it may be that such women could be at risk of um, developing endometriosis another thing is having a short menstrual cycle a short menstrual cycle in the sense that you bleed for less than the average five to seven days that majority of women have so if your blood flow when you're on your period is about three two three days perhaps such women in that category may be more at risk of developing endometriosis another thing that scientists and those that study women with these conditions have found is that some women who develop endometriosis 
go into menopause late. They go into menopause late. And so that means when on average, um, again, menopause is, I'm sorry, I didn't explain. Menopause is when a woman effectively stops her reproductive life. And we say it's when a woman has not had 12 consecutive periods, then she has entered menopause. And that's when she stopped ovulating and um, her, her reproductive hormones, um, their, their um, levels have come uh, come so low that she can no longer produce or she can no longer release eggs and can no longer fall pregnant that's menopause and on average for many women again this is a number that varies in some parts of the world women are in their four, late 40s and they've gotten into menopause and um, on average it could be around the age of 50 to 51 but if a woman is older when she gets into menopause so she may be 52 54 going upwards into that um range um, and she is she still has not seen her period. Such women may be at the risk of developing endometriosis. So we're lots of looking at um, or so those maybe might be the women who have endometriosis. What do they have in common? I would like to say is that a woman who starts her period early and a woman who finishes her period late, it means that they've been exposed to these hormones for such a long time. So they have they're under the influence of these hormones for a lot longer than women who sort of start at the average time and stop at the average time. Of course, you can't rule out the possibility of your genes being associated with endometriosis. Please don't forget, we don't know all these things for certain. It doesn't mean that for a woman who has endometriosis, all her children, all her female children will go on to have endometriosis after her. But there have been some studies that suggest that there might be a link in some cases. Other things that we know or that we our studies demonstrate some link with having endometriosis are being overweight, being obese, eating lots of red meat and exposure to certain chemicals. What about what they call the protective factors, protective risk factors. So that means um, a woman is less likely to have endometriosis. If you look at her history and look at her lifestyle pattern, she's less likely to have endometriosis. So they say women who have a diet that is high in fruit and vegetable and um, takes omega oil, omega-3 oil supplements, women who have multiple pregnancies, so twin, triplet, and so on, pregnancies, and mothers who practice prolonged breastfeeding. So some women um, who breastfeed might stop after six months or nine months or 12 months, whichever, but those who have prolonged breastfeeding tend to have, um, tend to be less likely to have endometriosis. And one of the threads, <laughs> particularly for women who are breastfeeding for longer or women who have multiple pregnancies, um, may be something to do with the exposure to hormones. But again, I don't want you to go away thinking that, well, if somebody has had twins and every woman who's had twins or triplets is unlikely to develop endometriosis, that's not true. It's not um, you know, we can't completely generalize. We can say that in studies, we have found these associations and it may be more likely to be the case. So just think about it. If this is you, um, you, you know, somebody with endometriosis, perhaps in the family and you're thinking about it or you have symptoms like what we've described and some of these particular things might fit in your category, then it may be that this is something that you should be thinking about to look at what's causing your symptoms. And I think it's important that we're having the discussion because Many women have these symptoms and they don't go ahead to speak to their medical practitioners. Um, either we sit on them for such a long time or ignore them or don't understand what they are. Um, these, none of the symptoms that I showed um, a few minutes ago, none of them should be ignored. Please always have that discussion with your medical practitioner. So we're talking about why endometriosis happens. We've said that we don't really know exactly why this condition develops. We're still doing lots of research in that area, but we do have some, some associations between um, endometriosis. And I've listed the ones that are risk factors for developing it and some protections against developing it. So let's go on to number two. Now, this is an interesting one, but it is quite asked in the context of um, a woman with um, endometriosis or just wanting to be educated about how the womb works. And this looks at the endometrial thickness i've got a i think i've got an image here that would be of i think would be of interest so let's just look at it here and i can explain what i mean let me take away the question so that you can see clearly so we're talking about endometrial thickness and you might hear that you might come across it um 
in terms of your pregnancy, your scan, or some something else. It might just be mentioned by your doctor, and you're wondering what what's what's the relevance of endometrial thickness. So. Let's talk about why it's important. Now, the endometrium, the endometrium is that bit of the, um, is the inner lining of the womb. So on this first picture where it says normal endometrium, you can see highlighted, highlighted in this nice cream color um, is the inner lining, the inner layer of the womb, that's the endometrium. And on the other side, under the term endometrial hyperplasia, you see that that nice thin um, cream colored lines disappeared and is replaced by this thick red, <laughs> red space. Um, so what we're saying is, when the nice thin layer or slim layer of the womb here becomes thicker and is replaced by what you can see on the other side, then you're talking about endometrial thickness. The other word for it is endometrial hyperplasia. So these might be terms that your doctor would use in, um, you know, from time to time, depending on what it is that you're doing. And the endometrium is important. It's the inner, um, the inner lining of the womb. And of course, this is where the baby will implant. So if you look at this image, for example, the dark red um, space is just demonstrating the um, endometrial tissue. It's usually very very, very um, filled with lots of rich blood vessels, very rich space, because of course, it's going to support the placenta, it's going to support the baby. So it's very rich space. And you can see this is how the, the structure fleshy space, which is going to support the um, baby's development. Okay, so we're talking about endometrial um, thickness and why it's important. And the thickness of the endometrium changes all along your reproductive life. It doesn't remain the same. It's not that you're born and this is the way it is. It does, it does change and I'll explain why it changes. Before a girl or a woman starts having her menstrual cycles, it's thin, the endometrial, the, that lining, that space, the inner space where the um, baby will sit up the womb, and the, the lining is quite thin before a woman starts um, having periods. But after her cycle begins, then it starts to change and the change depends on how much the exposure of estrogen and progesterone um, that the womb experiences. So, for example, during a menstrual flow, if the, a woman is on her period, the endometrium will be relatively thin. At that point, it's actually shedding because it would be it would be shedding the um, egg that wasn't fertilized and the rest of blood vessels that weren't used to support a growing baby. That's essentially what you're shedding when you have your period. So by the end of your period, <clears throat> Your, or by the uh, during your, your period during that time is thin between two to four millimeters if you want the figures if you want the numbers and it's important because sometimes you get a scan report they say endometrial thickness is xyz and you're wondering what does this mean is it normal is it not well this is what we're referring to so around the time of your period it's very thin is the thinnest that you would expect so as your period ends okay your body is now starting to do something and that's preparing for the next egg to come through to be released by the ovary and not just that the the same signals that go to your ovary to say right let's start getting the next egg ready those signals come to your womb and say right another egg is coming there's a possibility it might be fertilized and she may fall pregnant let's start getting ready it's not going to wait for it to happen before it starts getting ready the body's working in tandem so all these things are happening so while the egg is starting it's it's mature it's getting more mature getting ready to be popped out of the ovary the womb is itself getting ready so that line in the endometrium starts to get bigger, getting the womb ready. By the time ovulation is just about to happen, it's grown. You know, we said between two and four millimeters, could be about 11 millimeters by the time the um, ovulation is about to happen. And just after ovulation, it has grown even more to about 16 millimeters. So it's become quite thick. And the reason for that is because if your body is aware that the egg has been released, it may get fertilized. It needs to have a nice, firm support structure for the egg to implant because that's where the egg is going to implant into the endometrium. OK, and um, so if, of course, if no, if pregnancy doesn't happen, if there's no fertilization of the egg, the lining, that lining is shared with the egg and that comes out as your next menstrual period. That's what happens. And by the time you get pregnant, of course, it gets a lot thicker because it's supporting a growing baby and placenta. Now, can it happen if you're not pregnant? Can your endometrium get thicker? Because remember in that, um, let me just pull that up again. Remember in this 
yes, I showed you um, how a normal endometrium looks and how an, a thick endometrial or endometrial hyperplasia look. You can see how different they are. Can you have this kind of um, um, occurrence outside of pregnancy? Yes, it is possible. Um, we refer to it as endometrial hyperplasia, and it happens because of excess estrogen. We have both estrogen and progesterone um, exerting effects on your reproductive organs, your um, womb, your ovaries and tubes and all that. When excess estrogen, when the estrogen appears to be performing or ex acting excessively compared to progesterone, you can have endometrial hyperplasia. It's important, so please pay attention. If you're looking at that scan report and you're wondering, an excessively thick endometrium can suggest things like cancer of the womb or cancer of the ovary. It's not all, in all the cases, but if the endometrial thickness, given the time of the month where your scan was done, if the thickness is, is more than what we would expect, then we'd be concerned, we're looking at things, could there be um, a possibility of cancer? But it could also be thicker because of conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, or if you're having hormone treatments like HRT, for example, or tamoxifen, another um, hormone type, uh, type of hormone treatment. Also, women who are overweight or obese, they tend to have uh, more exposure to estrogen, and so they have more, uh, they have thicker endometrium, um, as well as conditions where there's chronic inflammation. So I thought this was a, I thought this was a good question to go through. I thought it was a good question. It's not directly related, to be honest with you, to um, endometriosis and what's causing endometriosis. But a lot of the times, as ladies, we do go for scans, and one of the things that are talked about when you have your pelvic scan examining the womb is your endometrium and th the thickness or not of your endometrium. And I know I've talked about um, thick endometrium, but it, a thin or a thinner endometrium could also be a problem if your um, womb is not responding to the, is the hormones or if the hormones are not um, being produced as they should be, that might also have an effect. And these things, imagine a thin endometrium which will be unable to support um, a pregnancy. So it's, it's just good to be aware of um, these things. So let us go to our next question. Let me just quickly switch to number three. By the way, please don't forget to like the video. If you're finding it useful, please and subscribe to our channel thank you so much for the support we've been getting we're growing in such amazing i was thinking the other day of um when we were at was it 25 or 250 subscribers and the world of 10,000 looked so far away i thought how on earth is it going to happen but really we're getting there and it's from it's the support from you guys and i just want to appreciate that so please don't forget to like the video if you've got a question please um, um send that to me in the comment section i go through them as much as i can so number three we are talking about how much endometrial thickness is required for conceiving so that's related to what we've just been talking about um We've looked at the different ways that the endometrium changes. And I think it's really important, please, your endometrium is always responding to the particular time of the month that you are. That's normal. That's what should happen. Um, so by the time that you're getting ready for a baby, as we've said, your um, endometrium comes around the time of ovulation, about 16 millimeters, um, you know, and even more than this by the time the baby is there, the egg that's been fertilized, implants. Um, so we're looking at making sure that you're, you're going through those changes. It's important that you're experiencing those changes um, at the time of ovulation. Um, it's growing from 11 millimeters, more than 16 millimeters, and even more as the, um, as the egg develops. Okay, so the fourth question, where does endometriosis come from? Now, this is the opportunity I have to talk about the different theories I mentioned at the beginning. And I'd said, we don't know what causes it, but we have some ideas about what may be responsible. If it's a combination of the of the different theories or if it's none of them and something else that we don't know of still in um, doing studies. Um, so we talk about retrograde menstruation. Um, that's just a big word or big words that just describe the possibility that instead of menstrual blood going out through the vagina, it's going the opposite direction. So it's going back inside the abdomen and the peritoneum, and that's how endometriosis develops. So that's one of the oldest theories we have around this. We also have thoughts about um, trouble with the immune system. Um, and that particular theory suggests that inside the peritoneum where the womb and the other organs um, um, exist, where they stay, there's supposed to be some cells of the immune system whose job is to get rid of 
pieces of tissue that shouldn't belong there. And if those cells don't happen to be there at the time they're supposed to be, then that causes those endometriosis cells to develop. So that's the immune theory. There's also the theory about blood vessels. You know, your blood vessels go everywhere around the body. So some, um, some scientists suggest, well, it could be blood vessels that are carrying this womb tissue. They move the womb tissue from the womb and take it to that side or take it to that area. That's the possibility. Um, there's also another theory that looks at the development of the tissue, you know, as we're growing or even as we're, when we're, when we're still um, in our mother's wombs and we're developing, suggests that some tissues that are meant for the abdomen for a meant for different um, organs in the abdomen somehow transition to become womb tissue so that something goes wrong in terms of messaging. This structure was supposed to be that, it was supposed to be fallopian tube, but as development was happening, something went wrong, a signal wasn't, wasn't moved or wasn't directed appropriately, and then it started to develop as womb tissue. I know this is, it's all very, it was, it was all very sketchy, I know, but these are some of the thoughts. So we don't yet have an answer. We only have theories for why endometriosis happens. A lot of studies are still going into it, and it's interesting to look at these studies, and one we hope um, because given the amount of distress that women experience from endometriosis, knowing what causes it so that you can stop it and prevent it, that would be so welcome. That's what that's what we need. Now, before we go further into the video, guys, I would love to say big thanks to my partner, StreamYard. You guys know I have been doing live streams since, oh, since like forever. It's, I think it's just been over 12 months now. <laughs> but... I use StreamYard. If you're an educator, I am an educator. I love talking about what I know. I love talking about what I've learned, my experience with my patients and what I've learned in my practice of medicine. I like sharing it. And what I, the reason I love doing that is because I want you to, to have, ex, to have um, for my expertise, I want you to have practical, accurate knowledge. Um, and I love giving that out. And StreamYard is a wonderful platform that you can use if you're an educator, if you have something that you want to share with people, you want to get it across to a large audience, you want to use a wider audience, please come and use StreamYard. StreamYard is a very simple to use streaming service. I, please trust me, believe me, that if, if I can use StreamYard, you will not have any problems using StreamYard. Minimal fuss, um, you don't you don't need to create a, um, you know, a, a login every time you create your account once. You don't need to log in every single time you need to use it. It's very um, simple to use. They've got a fantastic um, customer service team, whether it's on chat or email or whatever. Um, so really um, dynamic, even with the free version, even with the free version. And you get a lot more perks if you go on to the pro version. So if you're thinking about um, expanding your education, if you're thinking about expanding your um, the, the value of what you're delivering as either a content creator or a health educator, consider StreamYard. And please use the, the link in the description box below to get a special deal with StreamYard um, and hopefully you know come on board and start spreading magic messages to get people living better lives. Okay. So that's it for um, num question number four. Number five, let's have a look. Um, let us take this one here. So question number five, endometriosis, when to go to hospital? Thank you so much if you're watching, if you're joining the stream live, let me know where you are and um, watching from, what your thoughts are about endometriosis. If you've got any comments or questions, please share. Right, when to go to hospital? You see, I think this is an interesting question. I'm just looking for that video on the symptoms. Yeah, I think this is an interesting question. And, you know, let me tell you why. When to go to hospital? You know, saying that um, sometimes women don't know at which point to, or whether to even look for help. And one of the things I really want to emphasize is that things like this, um, having, let's get rid of this, yeah. Things like this, having pelvic pain, painful periods, experiencing pain doing sex okay it's, it's painful it's painful it's not uncomfortable painful or experiencing pain when you're going to do your number two or doing a poo or passing urine especially during your periods or back pain it's unexplained you've not been lifting anything heavy even at that and this pain is is not explained this this thing shouldn't be ignored we need to look into them we need to know what's causing them so that we can find out what the best treatment is i talked about um excess blood um because of heavy periods 
uh, when women have endometriosis, they also have periods that are either very, very long or they are un unexpected, they're unscheduled, and they also experience just different co constitutional problems. You feel bloated because the womb is, in, is irritated, it's inflamed, um, especially if there's tissue that's around the tubes or the ovaries that are this, this damaged because of endometriosis, you know, all that can cause discomfort within the abdomen. So a woman feels bloated or she has nausea, vomiting, and of course, fertility problems. So we're looking at the question of when, when should one go to hospital? When is the best time to go to hospital? And I think it all depends on the symptoms. If you're experiencing these symptoms, experiencing these symptoms, and you're struggling to get on top of them, this is not something that you can use simple pain medicine to, to attend to, then you should be speaking to your doctor, you should be looking for advice from your health provider to, to um, do tests that will explain the symptoms and get you the right treatment. So please, having these symptoms, any of these symptoms that we're looking at on the screen at the moment, um, especially when they are persistent or severe, then please bring them to the attention of your health provider so that we can get answers, okay? So let us move. Um, let's get to the next one. I'm just going to take this off and I'm going to pull up the next question. I hope you're finding some value from this. Please let me know. I hope this is useful. We don't talk about it too much, but please let me know. Um, will endometriosis show up on ultrasound? So as you know, as women, we're used to so many different types of tests that we do. Um, a woman comes with heavy periods, for example, one of the things that we start talking about is ultrasound, which is all well and good. It is useful to detect many different conditions. Endometriosis is not one of them. Remember that we said endometriosis, it's womb tissue or womb-like tissue that's located outside the womb. So if you're doing a scan and you're trying to look at the womb, you may not, you will not identify those tissues. And in fact, the um, ideal treatment, uh, the ideal test, we call it gold standard, is what's known as a laparoscopy. And I've got a, I've got a, I've got an image of some kind of activity going on here. So you, this is the kind of um, test where they put two little, very little cuts into the abdomen, at the top of your abdomen. And what those cuts are doing is to help the um, doctor um, introduce a camera at the end of a thin, very thin telescope they pass it through the cut so that we can look at the internal organs so because what you're trying to see is see is on the top of those organs can you see abnormal looking tissue those are the endometriosis patches whether it's the tubes or whether it's the ovaries whether it's the tissue around the um those organs or the bowel then you you're looking you're, so your camera is looking at them you can't do that with an ultrasound scan so you, this is this this is just to explain why you go for an ultrasound and it says oh it's normal. So what's causing your problem? The next step is to have further tests, and they could be things like a laparoscopy. It could be things like MRI or CT scans, depending on the center where you are. The, the ultrasound scan is not useless. It's one of the first things that's fairly straightforward things. Remember, going for an ultrasound scan is all you have is um, some gel on your abdomen and then the um sonographer um, or the doctor is, uh, is just rubbing the device gently across your abdomen or pelvis. And that's not invasive, is it? The laparoscope uh, laparoscopy is um, invasive today compared to the ultrasound because like I said, they're going to have little cuts where they're going to direct these um, devices in so they can have a good look. So the ultrasound is not the principal, um, is not the principal tool or the principal test that we use to identify endometriosis. We do need, it's useful to tell us there are no fibroids, it's useful to tell us X, Y, Z, um, but we need something else that will look into the um, abdomen, look into the pelvis to see are any of these organs covered with abnormalities that we can identify as endometriosis. So, okay guys, let's go to the next question. We're on number six, we're doing very well. So let's have a look at number seven. And I know this is one, um, one big area that um, affects lots of women. Uh, we have different ways of classifying endometriosis. That means that not every woman will have the same stage of endometriosis. Some will have what we call mild disease um, or stage one, while others might have um, something in between and some will have very severe stage disease. <laughs> it's important. The staging of the endometriosis is something that, you know, scientists are, they don't agree 100% on because a woman can have mild endometriosis where they say she's got just one or two spots or one spot somewhere. She can have as 
bad pain or even worse pain that somebody with the severe form, if you like, and that severe means that there's quite extensive, more than one patch or tissue or organ with endometriosis. So we don't use that staging to, um, to determine who has more pain or who is suffering more. Each person can seriously be impacted no matter how uh, mild or severe the disease is. And one of the things about endometriosis is its effect, its ability to affect um, the chance or the possibility of a woman to become pregnant, to conceive naturally. And according to the studies, we have up to 30%, one in three women can have difficulty getting pregnant with endometriosis. Many cases, we don't know why um, this happens, particularly if, in people that have the so-called mild disease, where there is, there's obviously nothing blocking the tube, the ovary doesn't appear to be damaged, but they still have problems getting pregnant. It is very clear for somebody who has extensive disease, severe endometriosis, it's clear, it makes sense why they might have trouble getting pregnant because perhaps the ovaries are damaged, they contain cysts, or, um, you know, I talked about sticky tissues because that's what the endometriosis patches do with the irritation from the bleeding, they start forming scars or they get sticky, they stick tissues together. So perhaps things like the tube might be blocked. So of course the egg cannot pass into the womb and that can affect fertility. So it's clear how that could affect, it, it prevent a woman from falling pregnant. But some of the studies suggest that with somebody who has endometriosis, could it have something to do with the quality of the eggs? Could the condition just create that environment where they don't have good quality eggs? Could it be that because of endometriosis, the eggs can't travel effectively in the fallopian tube? They also think, could it be that because of the irritation and the inflammation caused by endometriosis being present, the sperm can't survive after intercourse, the sperm are able to survive so they cannot fertilize the eggs. And the other thought is endometriosis may affect the way the eggs are released. So the woman cannot ovulate um, um, on a month by month basis as she should do normally. Again, this is something that given how important it is, you will agree with me that we do need so many more studies to help us understand in terms of trying to prevent and treat this problem. But these are some of the thoughts, how endometriosis affects fertility. A lot of women could have this problem. A lot of women do have this problem. Um, and each woman has to be treated in an individual basis to be able to understand um, what treatment best or what method um, best suits her uh, in terms of getting, getting pregnant. Okay, so we're moving on quickly. Our next question is, are endometriosis and PCOS related? Now, before I get into that, I have, I think, two or three videos on the channel on PCOS. So please go and have a look at it. I talk about what is PCOS. I talk about uh, different treatments, including natural treatments that could help people with PCOS. But these two conditions are quite different. They're quite distinct. And yes, they affect women, women of childbearing age, but they're quite different in terms of the cause, in terms of the symptoms. I've, and I've been talking about the symptoms of endometriosis, so we're familiar with those. Um, but they can, both of these conditions affect fertility, as you will know, PCOS. And PCOS means polycystic ovary syndrome. Um, can, PCOS can also... Um, challenge a woman's ability to have preg to fall pregnant naturally. So women in PCOS, they have irregular menstrual periods because one of the issues is they are not ovulating every month. Um, they are, um, these are women who may have cysts in their ovaries, multiple cysts in their ovaries that are not functioning the way they should. And apart from not ovulating every month, they could also experience or have high of the male hormones. We call them androgens. So if we do blood tests for them, you could find that their levels of male hormones are high. We all have, both men and women have mixtures of estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, for example. But when they tend to be have a, they tend to be of a higher volume in men and lower volume in women. But when you take a blood sample from a lady and she has some PCOS symptoms and she also has high levels of um, androgen hormone like testosterone and we also do scans and the scans may demonstrate that her um, ovaries have multiple cysts and so on. These are some of the things that we use to diagnose PCOS. So um, common symptoms of PCOS, I talked, we talked about your periods being irregular or hardly having periods or just on, on scheduled. Some women can go several months before she has, a, before they have a period. There are also things like um, 
weight gain, um, thinning hair on the head, or excess hair growth in other parts of the body like the chest, having oily skin or skin that's prone to acne. Very rarely, very rarely, a woman could have PCOS and endometriosis. I know, this thing about human body, it is possible. Okay, so again, you know, sort of looking at, and this is why when we, when each person comes and you're looking at the treatment. Some of these things you just can't treat. There's no one word or one line answer. It might include doing lots of tests after trying to find out all the symptoms, doing lots of tests, with blood tests and scans and some might be invasive tests like camera tests and um, minimally invasive tests like camera tests to look into those organs and try and identify what is going on. Again, I do have a playlist. I, I will add that. I don't think it's on the description box here, but I'll add that at the end of the video. So if you want to learn more about PCOS, please go and have a look at that for me. So we are coming nicely to the next one. Please don't forget to like the video. Thank you so much for popping in. I've got a couple of people I can see here who've popped in. Thank you so much for that, for joining. I do appreciate it. I know a lot of my viewers are shy and um, I get lots of questions, but that's okay. Um, the important thing is getting value, getting understanding. And please, if you do have any questions that you want to ask or you want to contribute, I love contributions. I love comments. Please let me know. Send them down to us. Why endometriosis causes pain? The I think the simplest answer to this is pain. Pain is a big issue in endometriosis. Um, I've shared that video. Um, and that's why I put um, the thumbnail for our you know for the stream today um was this lady who obviously looks so uncomfortable and that's why i put that because even though it's not just tummy pain or pelvic pain or back pain but pain is a big issue and what do you know many women tend to just you know manage it or it's one of those things painful periods your mother dealt with it this is how it, it, it runs in our families and i would like us to break that cycle because it isn't normal um, and if it's happening, we should be looking at what's responsible, what's causing it. So pain, pelvic pain, period pain, those are big issues in endometriosis. It could be pelvic pain that comes and goes with the menses or that is there all the time. And it just sort of becomes a chronic pain that she just continues with. And imagine how that could affect work or going to school and so on. It could be pain in the back. And sometimes that could even go down into the legs. It could be... Um, and painful cramps, so you have your periods and then you have very painful, crampy periods. What about pain during sexual intercourse? As I've mentioned before, pain passing urine or pain during number two, going to the toilet. Pain when you're trying to exercise. So this can be so pervasive. What causes it though? Why does it happen? So remember that what's going on with endometriosis is that tissue that it behaves like the womb is found in places where they shouldn't be. And those tissues are subject to estrogen and um, progesterone and the levels of estrogen and progesterone keep going up and down they keep traveling up and down during the course of a woman's menstrual um, cycle during the, the month and um, so at the time where the womb is shedding and um, then these tissues wherever they are are also bleeding and with the bleeding they become sticky so not only are they going to destroy structure the architecture of wherever they are um they'll disrupt it that's number one but they also make the the, the, the the tissue sticky and when tissues are sticky and they stick together they can cause blockages they can they can fix onto other organs or tissue like nerves that will cause pain and um, they can just cause inflammation lead to pain the simple it's just the fact that they are there when they're not supposed to be that disconnect that um schism is problematic for the body that causes discomfort the womb itself is irritated because it's it's experiencing within the context of somebody having endometriosis there's that um there's that bulky womb um situation because you could have tissue that's growing on the ovary close by on the tube close by within the tissues holding them together all that irritates the womb and that causes the pain so why endometriosis is painful there can be so many different reasons the pain during sex the pain during urination or doing poo or when you're pooing or doing exercise all of that can deal with where the, the endometriosis patches are located where they're located how many of them and don't forget i said sometimes even just one patch can be can cause excruciating pain. 
Um, and we're not saying that um, a woman who has just one patch doesn't suffer because she's only got one patch. She can experience um, serious problems comparable to somebody who has um, maybe a number of different patches in scattered around. Perhaps they're not very deep into the organs. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite uncomfortable. And this is why the condition... These are the reasons why the condition can cause pain, simply because of the nature of damage it causes, the type of damage it causes. Don't imagine it, you get a cut, you know, get nerves all around the body, just bleeding in an area where it shouldn't be happening. That's irritation enough to cause um, discomfort for any woman. Okay, so we... Uh, we just dealt with number nine, and here we are, number 10. Do you know, I thought this was a really interesting question. Are uh, endometriosis symptoms similar to pregnancy? Um, and I thought it was really interesting because on the face of it, you want to say, you know, no, <laughs> endometriosis is a condition with all these things going on. Like we've said, we've talked about the different um, symptoms that you can have the pain situation, the abnormal bleeding situation. So it's quite distinct, clearly distinct from pregnancy. And pregnancy is a natural um, condition. Many women go through pregnancy without any complications, but pregnancy can become easily and very quickly complicated. So it's something that we take very seriously. And we can identify a few issues in pregnancy that can feel um, like some of the discomfort you could have in pregnancy, but by no means the two conditions are clearly quite different. Um, some women have um, symphysis pubis diastasis. That's a condition in pregnancy where the pelvic bones, they're sort of weak and soft, the ligaments in the pelvis as the baby grows. Because that tissue is soft and weak, it's not able to support, um, it's not able to, it, it, yes, it's meant, it's meant to be there. It's meant to relax as the baby grows, really. That's its, that's its function, to stretch as the baby grows. But that stretching in some women can be so uncomfortable, making it causing pain, making it difficult to walk as the pregnancy, as the baby grows bigger because it's stretching the pelvic girdle. Um, so that's a condition that can happen in pregnancy where a woman gets pelvic pain. Women can develop infections in pregnancy and that can also cause pelvic pain, can cause irregular bleeding, and that can be similar to endometriosis. So to some extent, there can be a little bit of um, similarity. Of course, you don't have persistent bleeding in pregnancy as you would have in endometriosis. So there are quite clear differences, but there are some areas where there are some similarities. Okay, those are the 10 questions I wanted to cover in this stream. Um, they're not often, they're not things that you would randomly get in your in your books or in you know magazines when reading about endometriosis, but they, we do get them asked. And I wanted to make sure that there was at least a a base, a database where you can get this information. So thank you so much for watching. I hope this has been very useful. Please don't forget to like the video and um don't forget to subscribe to the channel, particularly if you found this session helpful. Remember that you can use our community forum. You're very much welcome to come and join in the discussions that we're having. Create your own threads if you want to learn something, if you want to share something or just participate in the discussion. And we've got moderators, including myself, that pop into the um, chats and share information, share knowledge. But there's also the opportunity to send a, an inquiry to us using the email health information service. Please make sure you use that if you need to. And again, I want to appreciate all those who support us on the chat channel um and hopefully we'll be coming again oh i was going to talk about um yesterday's video let me just have a quick look have i got youtube open let me just have a quick look at um this video went up yesterday and what we're talking about in the video please go and check it out um we're talking about missed pe missing your period yes missing your period but negative pregnancy test i get lots and lots of questions about this and Everybody has a kind of special scenario, which is fine, but they're generally generally similar. And I'd love you to go and watch that video if you're that kind of person who has issues about having used the morning after pill and your period has not arrived and your pregnancy test is negative. I know it's an anxious moment. This video might help to relieve the anxiety, to give you some answers. But of course, I'm happy to hear from you. So please let me know if you want to, if you want more information about it, use our service to clarify anything else. Okay, thank you so much for watching, guys. Thank you so much for spending time with me this afternoon. I hope you have a great weekend. Um, and I will see you again uh, next live stream on Friday.
and please anticipate a couple of videos on Thursday and some other point during the week. Take care, guys. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.